autumn and and thanks everybody for joining us today i think this is a really important topic as we recover from covid uh or some of us recovering from covid and we recognize that diagnostic imaging is going to be in more and more need um, because of the lag we had in, in doing that during the COVID uh, years. So the, I just wanted to bring to light as, again, the fact that the coalition did some work on medical imaging equipment energy monitoring. And this was work we did for Natural Resources Canada a number of years ago. We worked with three partner hospitals and the reference to that document was available in the invite that you received. So if you wanted to go back and look at the work we did, um, please do that. But that's also why we think we thought it was a good idea to explore this topic a little bit more. And we're so um, grateful that Dr. Moore Brown has joined us today. Dr. Brown is a radiologist at BC Cancer in Vancouver, a clinical assistant professor at UBC, and the Lower Mainland Medical Imaging CT Medical Practice Lead. A lifelong long enjoyment of the outdoors and a love of all living things led her interest in climate change and its health effects. In the last several years, she obtained a climate change and health certificate from Yale and a Cascades Canada Certificate in Fundamentals of Sustainable Health Systems. Dr. Brown co-chairs the Provincial BC Cancer Planetary Health Unit, which she co-founded in the spring of 2022. She is currently enrolled in the UBC Masters of Health Administration Program, School of Population and Public Health, where her capstone project is focused on engagement of frontline healthcare workers in low carbon, sustainable change. Please welcome Dr. Maura Brown. Sorry. Hi, everybody. Just get my slides started here. We're we good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you for coming today, everyone who's here. It's great to see the growing interest in addressing climate change in so many of our healthcare situations and colleagues. I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil Tooth peoples in Vancouver, BC, where I'm grateful to live, work, and play. I feel it's important in any discussion of the climate crisis that we recognize that although Indigenous peoples make up less than 5% of the global population, they are stewards of over 80% of the remaining biodiverse land on the planet. Indigenous peoples share a knowledge of and empathy for nature, and those of us who are not Indigenous have much to learn from them. Today's talk includes a brief reminder of the urgency of directing our attention to the health and climate crisis and the definition of the concept of planetary health Next, I'll focus on actions and opportunities in our personal and community lives that have the most impact in reducing emissions, many of which have corollaries in our healthcare workplace. And I'll spend some time on the importance of becoming involved to lead positive climate change in radiology. The warming stripes background to these slides is a visualization of our warming climate from 1850 to present, created by climate scientist Ed Hawkins. This is one of my favorite places where I often walk with my dog, a place that grounds me in these times of so much change. What I'm gonna talk about today can be difficult to hear. I've sat with this understanding for some time now and have incorporated the anguish of what is happening to our planet into my worldview. Some of you have likely considered this as well. For others, it will be new. The work I find in sustainable healthcare helps immensely with the climate anxiety and gives me hope and agency. I hope this talk inspires you to find climate positive actions in your life, whether they're small or large, they hope to give you purpose and hope. At the end of the talk, there'll be time for questions. There will be things we don't have answers to. I ask that we keep the discussion cordial and respectful. We are on this journey together and there's so much that can be achieved when we pool our ingenuity and resourcefulness. When we talk about the climate crisis, it's important to consider why it matters to each of us. Christina Lake is an annual trip and a happy place for our family. The bottom left photo is a normal summer. The bottom right is the same view off the dock in 2017 when forest fire smoke choked the valley so we could not even see the trees across the lake. We ended up having to travel through Northern Washington to get home because Highway 3 was blocked in both directions. However, there were fires in Washington as well. It was pretty scary. And although I grew up in a family where conversations about ozone holes, acid rain, and global warming were frequent, I realized then that although I was cycling to work and mostly vegetarian, I needed to do more. 
So I went and took the certificates from Yale and Cascades that Linda mentioned. I've attended many lectures and webinars with a focus on climate and health, and I'm happy to share these resources with anyone who's interested. The primary cause of climate change is human burning of fossil fuels. The Keeling curve is a graph that represents the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, named after its creator, Dr. Charles Keeling. Humans have emitted an increasing amount of CO2 from pre-industrial times to present, corresponding to an increase from 315 parts per million in 1958 to 421 parts per million a couple of weeks ago. Weather refers to short-term regional conditions, but climate change refers to longer-term alterations in the weather of a specific region. The excess CO2 forms a thick blanket around the Earth, causing global temperatures to increase. The scientists of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have identified 1.5 degrees C as a temperature we do not want to exceed. Carbon is forever in human timeframes, so limiting global warming means we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. If we had started to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in 1990, at the time of the first IPCC report, we would have had time to adjust gradually along the green dotted line. However, we didn't, humans didn't, emissions continue to rise, and we now have to make significant and rapid changes to meet that 1.5 degree target. The emissions gap is the difference between the attainable reductions in CO2 emissions from current policies, the red bar, and the emission reductions required to stay below 1.5 degrees, which is the blue bar. Emissions do continue to rise, and we need all sectors to contribute to deep emission reductions. Methane, which is the primary component of natural gas, is particularly noted as needing attention as it has increased rapidly in the last two decades and has a global warming potential 86 times that of CO2 over a 20 year time frame. In terms of health, the risks of action, sorry, the risks of inaction are becoming clearer. Climate change will become the defining narrative of human health in our lifetimes. As the Earth's energy imbalance worsens and global temperatures increase, extremes of weather will become more frequent and severe, which adversely affect health and our ability to provide health care. Extreme heat events will become more frequent and severe. As warm water holds, sorry, warm air holds more water, atmospheric rivers and flooding will worsen. Disturbed precipitation, precipitation patterns lead to drought and food insecurity. Wildfire seasons become longer and more intense, and ocean acidification impairs sea life. This is a 2021 graphic from the WHO, providing an overview of climate sensitive health risks, their exposure pathways and vulnerability factors. The important things to note from this graphic is that climate change impacts health both directly and indirectly, and that the effects are strongly mediated by environmental, social, and public health determinants. The most vulnerable are those in areas of geographic risk, Indigenous peoples, women, children, the elderly, those who live in poverty, and those who have pre-existing medical conditions and or poor access to health care. So in the short to medium term, the health impacts of climate change will be determined mainly by the vulnerability of populations, their resilience to the current rate of climate change, and the extent and pace of adaptation. In the longer term, the effects will increasingly depend on the extent <clears throat> to which transformational action is taken now to reduce our emissions and avoid breaching dangerous temperature thresholds and potentially irreversible tipping points. For those of you in healthcare, this is an excellent reference published by Health Canada over a year ago, or about a year ago. The chapter titles are on the left of the slide, and it provides a very comprehensive summary of the health challenges we will be facing in Canada, as well as the importance of acknowledging the increased vulnerability of those who are adversely impacted by the social determinants of health. The final chapter discusses the importance of education and preparation within the healthcare sector to adapt to our changing needs and demands. This is available for free online, and I'd strongly recommend having a look through it. The term co-benefits you'll hear often used to describe the positive effect on health that occurs with reduced burning of fossil fuels. Increased active transportation has immediate local effects improving local air quality. It may reduce the risk of some cancers, improves cardiorespiratory and mental health. An opportunity exists for healthcare providers to communicate to the communities we serve 
that actions to combat climate change and reduce our use of fossil fuels have a positive effect on their families and their community. This information may lead to changing the social narrative such that we might see actions progress addressing climate change. The premise of planetary health is that human well being over the long term depends on the well being of the earth, including its living and non living systems. Individual health is you or your patient. Public health is the local population. Global health is all people. One health is all of life. And planetary health is the whole system, recognizing that human health and the health of our planet are inextricably linked. The choices we make in our day-to-day -day lives make a big difference in our carbon footprint, particularly those of us from wealthy, high-consuming nations of the global north. This is said with the caveat that the term carbon footprint was created by fossil fuel companies to shift responsibility for emissions onto individuals, similar to the tobacco industry a couple of decades ago. It is acknowledged that we require both individual em emission reduction and system change to reduce the emissions as rapidly as we must. Those of us who live in the wealthy countries of the global north contribute far more than our fair share to the global CO2 burden, and we need to pull together and lower our emissions to stay within the 1.5 degrees. The goal is to have each person at under 2.5 tons of CO2 per person per year by 2030 for all countries. This graph is 2017 data, but little has changed, and those of us in wealthy countries have a ways to go. Also to note, the relatively rapid increase in emissions from 1990 is through the global richest 10%, who are responsible for almost half of the emissions growth. Decisions we make in our day-to-day -day lives that have the biggest impact in our carbon footprint involve how we move around, how we heat our buildings and hot water, and what we eat. These personal choices parallel initiatives to reduce emissions in the healthcare sector as well. And happily, these choices to reduce our carbon impact have immediate positive health co-benefits through reduced air pollution and improved air quality, indoor air quality. Cars and other um, transportation are the largest source of personal climate pollution for many people. Choosing car-free active transportation as much as possible has large individual health co-benefits due to improved physical and mental health and improves local population health through reducing air pollution. So at work, we can encourage cycling and public transportation for commuting as healthier alternatives than single cars. And the picture in the bottom right is me and my son. Yes, we really did take the train from Vancouver to Chicago. <laughs> it was a long journey. Um, a group of Canadian medical students created this app to bring attention to the carbon emissions generated by travel for residency interviews. I find it helpful looking at this to put it into perspective. So if one enters a cross-Canada trip from Vancouver to Halifax return, the provided answer is 1.33 tonnes of CO2 per person. It, the article in Science correlates the amount of Arctic sea ice loss per tonne of CO2 emissions. Considering these two together, this return trip from Vancouver to Halifax results in four square metres of Arctic summer sea ice loss per person. For this graph, please focus on the colour and the height of the bars. This is from a paper by climate scientist Kimberly Nicholas, and she divides the choices to reduce our individual carbon footprint into high impact in green, moderate impact in blue, and low impact in yellow. Note that although recycling, upgrading light bulbs, and washing in cold water do have a positive impact, and we don't want to stop doing these things, they are relatively lower compared to living car free, flying less, and consuming less meat. We can support these choices at work as well by encouraging virtual conferences and including vegetarian options for workplace meals. As 90% of the emissions of a consumable is built in by the time it gets to the end user, it is not possible to recycle ourselves out of the climate crisis. As you can see, the contribution of recycling is relatively low. We need to be consuming less. Our homes and buildings are a large part of our individual carbon emissions. The most important changes we can make are to electrify our indoor heating and cooling, our water heating, and our cooking, as noted above the dashed line. The, impact, the actions below the line are also helpful, and there's many more that are on this list. However, the impact of those is slightly less significant. In addition to contributing to climate change, cooking with gas is a source of pollutants with significant health effects. 
you may have heard of the recent US paper estimating 12.7% of childhood asthma is attributable to gas stove use, and this is similar to the childhood asthma burden of secondhand smoke. In support of this, these findings, a recent paper from the American Thoracic Society includes two statements that are important to healthcare workers. First, nitrous oxide, uh, nit sorry, nitrogen dioxide is a respiratory tract irritant at concentrations that may occur in homes during gas-based cooking. Exposure should be avoided by people with asthma. And two, there is strong evidence to eliminate natural gas hookups for new residential construction to mitigate the effects of methane, which is natural gas, on climate. These are strong statements from a large, well-respected American medical organization. What we eat is as important as how we cook it. The greenhouse gas emissions produced per kilogram of food are vastly larger for beef, lamb, and dairy compared to a plant-based diet. The average Western carbon footprint from food is about 1.7 tons of CO2 per year. Switching to vegetarian eating, this can be almost halved, and you can cut off another 15% if you forgo eggs and dairy. This is not to say that people need to go home and become vegan. Rather, it's to encourage everyone to cut back on meat consumption as much as you reasonably can within your life and increase plant-based meals also as much as possible. And we know that these actions also come with health co-benefits. For those who might wish to explore the impact of a plant-based diet at home and at work um, a little bit more, the Eat Lancet Commission defines a reference diet that meets culturally sensitive nutritional requirements within planetary boundaries and includes global reduction of meat consumption and increased consumption of fruit, vegetables, and legumes. It also points out that up to 50 to 60% of food is wasted globally, all the way along from the supply chain through to consumers. So attention to reducing food waste will also significantly reduce food-related emissions. Where we invest our money is important. The big five Canadian banks and many of the big U.S. banks are heavily invested in fossil fuel companies and infrastructure, both at home and globally. Individuals can divest from fossil fuels, and we can encourage our institutions to divest, our universities, pension plans, which has an even greater impact uh, through their scales of magnitude. On to now what we can do at work. Um, Ed Maybach is a social science professor at George Mason Center for Climate Change Communication, and he emphasizes the importance of changing the social narrative around climate change and suggests it's most effective through three maxims, simple messages, repeated often by trusted messengers. As trusted clinicians and healthcare leaders, we have a responsibility to play a role in communicating the urgency of reducing our emissions, the health co-benefits that exist within an active lifestyle using renewable energy, and strategies to get us there. In addition, an increasing number of lay press and peer-reviewed articles emphasize the importance of physician and healthcare advocacy for a healthy and stable climate. A recent Nature article emphasized that the most effective climate change communication is around impact on health and with positive messaging. As well as effective messaging, we are promoting good health when we advocate for active transportation, low emission heating of homes and buildings, and a plant forward diet. We can advocate through collective action in our communities, and we can work within the healthcare system to reduce our emissions and our waste. Providing healthcare is resource and energy intensive. With per capita emissions in Canada at 4.6% of national, sorry, per capita emissions are similar to developed nations and in total healthcare in Canada accounts for 4.6% of our national greenhouse gas emissions. The emissions from providing healthcare contribute to the burden of disease, which increases the need for more care. And in addition, extreme weather events such as floods and storms may limit the care we are able to provide. In 2020, the NHS set a global precedent as the world's first national health system to commit to net zero. Scope one, direct emissions from owned or directly controlled sources on site includes fossil gas burners or boilers for heating, fleet vehicles and anesthetic gases. Scope two are the indirect emissions from purchased energy, which is mostly electricity and they have committed to net zero for scope one and scope two by 2040. The supply chain, scope three, is the largest component at about 60 to 80%, however, is much more challenging to address as it involves multiple components of production and supply chain, 
often global, and includes a wide range from food to medicines, medical devices, and many more. And therefore, the net zero commitment is set at 2045. Andrew McNeil is a surgical oncologist who leads the Vancouver Coastal Health Planetary Health Lab and published this paper in 2021, a high-level overview of a sustainable healthcare system. Mitigating healthcare emissions requires addressing factors driving demand for care, as well as supply-side energy and resource management. Through emphasis on health promotion, addressing social determinants of health, and supporting patient-centered primary care, the need for resource-intensive and expensive hospital care may be reduced. The second step is to ensure that the right care is provided to the right patient at the right time. This includes avoiding unnecessary investigations and treatment through things such as clinical decision support tools, for example, choosing wisely. Excess capacity is an inefficient use of resources such as empty hospital beds or medical imaging equipment unused and in standby mode. It is also important not to undertreat or delay care as this may result in more advanced disease requiring greater resources. Transforming the culture of healthcare towards resource stewardship requires patient-centered care that prioritizes health and well-being. The third step is to reduce emissions and waste that arise from the required supply of health services and best optimize the efficiency and environmental performance of healthcare services. Viewed through this lens, radiology has roles in improving public health at the first level through imaging-based screening programs and supporting our primary care colleagues. Imaging also has a role in matching supply to demand, reducing scanner idle time through optimizing patient scheduling and reducing low yield exams. However, most of the rest of this talk will be about reducing emissions and waste from the imaging that is needed for best patient care. This slide provides a practical framework through which to envision sustainable healthcare with a reference to medical imaging departments. As you can see, many of these climate friendly choices parallel the choices available outside of work. Education of healthcare colleagues and patients is essential to encourage use of clinical decision support tools in choosing the right test. In an office setting, education may be conversations about powering off computers and printers after hours. Advocacy for supply chain initiatives and responsible purchasing applies to all business. Assessing a potential partner company for their supply chain emissions from sourcing raw materials to manufacture to transportation and end of life care. As manufacture of medical imaging equipment is resource and energy intensive, considering purchase of refurbished, refurbished and rebuilt equipment where available and appropriate. As we will see, the energy use of PAX machines and medical imaging equipment is not insignificant and contributes to scope to emissions through purchased electricity. This is, of course, a much greater concern when purchased electricity is generated through burning of fossil fuels, such as coal and natural gas. Also good practice for any department is to source caterers or restaurants who will provide you with robust vegetarian options. Encourage your workplace to promote transit and cycling with rebates and readily accessible, clean, safe bike storage facilities. We can support telemedicine and virtual or local conferences to reduce the emissions from flying. Uh, now I'll provide a little more detail about medical imaging departments. As mentioned earlier, scope three, or the supply chain, is responsible for over two thirds of healthcare related emissions. Reducing this will require transitioning from the current linear economy model to a circular economy. In a linear supply chain, raw materials are used for each product. The product is manufactured, it is used, and then discarded. This is expensive and generates excessive waste and pollution with the associated health damages. The circular economy involves maintaining manufactured products in circulation, distributing resource and environmental costs over time and with repeated use. As it is not possible through recycling single-use disposables to get to net zero, we do need systemic change to a circular economy for as much as is appropriate and possible. This is one example that um, may be of use for interventional radiology suites, re having reusable instead of disposable gowns. So this paper on the reusable surgical gown compared them to disposables over a four year time period. I've written in red type the calculated savings in water consumption, energy, solid waste and emissions. Also over the four year period, while they saved 3.3 million disposable gowns, they also saved $1.1 million. Many of these low carbon initiatives are also cost friendly, cost neutral or even cost negative. 
The environmental benefits, sorry, just go back. The environmental benefits to reusable gowns are further extended when repurposing of spent surgical gowns, um, no longer usable as sterile, can be uh, personal protective equipment for non-sterile clinical applications. This bolsters the supply chain resilience by reducing dependence on buying more single-use disposables. And then at the end of their clinical life, reusable gowns can be used as fiber fill in industry, for example, upholstery and um, insulation. In medical imaging, we tend to discuss the financial burden and radiation exposure as the potential harms associated with imaging. And yet the public health harms of pollution from the energy waste or energy use for scanning are only recently becoming part of our conversation. The energy use of CT and MRI is substantial, and therefore so are the carbon emissions from producing electricity. Even for sites who purchase electricity produced with renewables, if they can reduce their need for electricity, this will free up space on the grid for other electrification. Powering medical imaging equipment, in particular CT and MRI, is inherently efficient today with up to two thirds of total energy use for CT while in the idle state between patients are waiting to scan. Low utilization contributes to energy inefficiency. For MRI, a third of the energy use is during the system off state and this is mostly due to the need for constant helium cooling and operation of the cooling head. Working with vendors to encourage development of low energy consumption, idle and system off states may allow for considerable energy savings in CT in particular, because actual productive energy demand is confined to short minutes of scanning. In addition, currently hospitals are built and function around patient and workflow, However, hospitals of the future will likely be constructed with energy savings in mind to optimize waste heat recovery, greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce energy costs. Although it might be assumed that our medical imaging equipment would be powered off in non-operational hours, we found that in our local area with 38 CT scanners, there were only three left in the system shutdown mode routinely after hours. So in collaboration with our local energy provider and a facilities operations team, we measured the power that could be saved if a scanner was shut off in non-operational hours. Our study showed an annual savings of over 14,000 kilowatt hours, in overnight system shutdown mode compared to power on mode, which in BC where relatively electricity is quite cheap, um, saved $1,215. These savings in both cost and emissions would be much higher where electricity is more costly. And we hope that this pilot project stimulates conversations about energy use and waste in medical imaging departments. This Australian study compared emissions from various medical imaging modalities summarized in this bar graph. The graph also displays the significant proportion of energy that arises from electricity use, which is in the blue. In this study, about 15% of the energy was generated renewably. Therefore, the energy consumed, particularly for MRI and CT, has a large carbon footprint. Also in this study, the attributional energy, which includes operational and standby energy, are the bigger bars. And the consequential use per CT is the smaller bars, and this does not include the standby energy use. So, could, so again, you can see the considerable waste of energy in the standby frame. The greenhouse gas impact of medical imaging equipment can be reduced by purchasing electricity generated through renewables and encouraging future work with vendors to optimize low energy standby idle mode settings. This study compared the total emissions during production phase of imaging equipment, which includes the entire manufacturing process from raw materials to delivery, to the use phase of equipment from delivery to end of equipment life. For CT, the manufacture of the equipment, the production phase, creates more total greenhouse gas emissions than is created over the entire lifetime of the, using the equipment. And in this study, only 10 to 15% of electricity was generated renewably and therefore the greenhouse gas impact of the electricity in this study was quite large. In BC, where electricity is 97% renewable, the proportion of energy that is production phase would be significantly greater. And therefore in the future, as options become available for refurbished and rebuilt equipment in line with the circular economy model, this purchase will significantly reduce the emissions, the cost and the environmental impact of imaging equipment. Of interest, the paper notes, the production phase energy to build one CT scanner is equivalent to building 56 cars. 
The importance of addressing the energy use and emissions impact of medical imaging equipment is emphasized when we review the increasing utilization of medical imaging equipment, increasing year over year. In this paper, which compared some US facilities, which are the solid line dots, and Ontario in the dashed line dots. And they found comparable increase in utilization rates for all, mod all modalities in both locations. Rates per thousand person years are higher for older adults than for 18 to 65 year olds and children. And even though growth slowed before 2013, after 2013, imaging rates have increased on average 4% per year. An Australian paper showed similar findings with an overall increase in imaging by 9% in a five year period from 2016 to 2021. So it's important that we pay attention to the energy use of our large imaging equipment machines. This IRIS study of a PAC system, picture archive and communication system for radiology reporting, was uh, looked at the machines left on overnight and found they used considerable energy, which obviously does not add value to patient care. The same is true for printers and laser copiers, which use a lot of power. Printers and scanners can be programmed to low power mode for when not in use, and ideally are shut off completely overnight. Interestingly, you would think this would be routine, and it likely is for some. However, a surprising number of machines are just left on. This serves as a good reminder of how turning off one computer might at night may not seem like much. However, it definitely adds up when you talk about whole departments or facilities. In this study at Texas Children's Hospital involving a complete life cycle assessment of an interventional radiology suite, they found that almost half of total emissions came from room temperature and climate control, similar to the findings in operating rooms. Of this, 25% was after hours wasted energy. As this is building heating and cooling, which is typically from burning fossil gas in boilers, significant emission savings can be realized by allowing a wider range of temperatures and reducing the frequency of room exchanges in after hours time. Also similar to ORs, the next biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in interventional radiology is single use disposables. Since 90% of emissions are built into a product by the time it reaches the end user, the most effective way to reduce emissions is to use less. So designing trays to get out only what that particular radiologist uses will limit waste and replacing single use disposables with reusables where appropriate is also effective. As the imaging equipment used in interventional radiology is typically for fluoroscopy, which although it wasn't measured separately in the Australian study, is closer to plain films than CT in energy use, the plug load here is smaller and used only 4% of the total energy. However, this would be higher in rooms where CT guidance is used for biopsies. To, to place our work to reduce emissions and waste in perspective, micro level change is at the personal level, a commitment to lower carbon choices in your personal life and where possible in your place of work. And leading change in this way does have a positive effect on people around you. Meso level change refers to a larger group or regional effort. Many of the ideas presented above would fall into this category. This may be in your community outside of work, or it may be within your healthcare facility or department. Examples might include using clinical decision support tools to reduce unnecessary exams, or to advocate for solar power, electricity, and renewables at your institution. Macro level effects are provincial or national efforts reducing the carbon footprint of healthcare. This may include design of clinical practice guidelines and standards, or advocating to phase out coal-fired electricity and switch to renewables. Centering the climate change conversation on health has a positive impact on changing social norms, which is what we need to generate changes in public policy that are required. So how do you get started? First, learn about health and climate. Determine why it means something to you. Read some books, attend a webinar or a course. There's lots of options out there. And as you look around, identify something you would like to see changed at work or at home. You can start small and it doesn't, don't be discouraged by complexity or the size of the task. Probably the most important is to find your allies. Great ideas come from interdisciplinary collaboration with others outside of your usual silo in healthcare. We need champions at all levels, technologists and department staff, all the way up to senior operations or administrative team members. Reducing emissions is a goal in most healthcare, most healthcare organizations now, so leadership will be on your side. Make a plan, build a PDSA cycle, choose your strategy and your tools. 
So I'm almost done. Quick little plug for uh, Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare and Cascades, which is a collaborative effort of the four organizations on this slide. They have really good webinars, foundations of sustainable healthcare courses, and playbooks to follow. This is the end here. <laughs> We're truly at a crossroads. Decisions we make this decade will affect human health for the rest of this century and beyond. The healthcare industry can and needs to be catalysts as society transitions to renewable energy and zero carbon living, which must happen rapidly. Perhaps you will find agency in being part of the solutions. As we act for positive change, no matter how small our efforts seem, the small actions add up to the larger system change that we need. And as well, finding purpose through contributing in a positive way definitely helps with climate anxiety. So in summary, we reviewed the concept of planetary health, which recognizes that human health and the health of our planet are inextricably linked. We talked about the most impactful sustainable choices we can make in our own lives, acknowledging we need both individual choice and system change. There are likely many of you who are not sure what they can contribute to the climate crisis or if what they would do would even matter. But I hope I've been able to illustrate for you that the choices we make absolutely do matter, that the small actions add up to system change, and that although change is required urgently, it is not too late. And I have some books here that I can talk about later at the end if we have time. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll pass it over to Miles now. Wow, thank you so much, Maura. That was just terrific. Uh, I learned a lot. I'm sure everybody attending learned a lot. We're now going to hear a little bit more on the sustainable purchasing side uh, from Dr. Miles Sargent. And I'd like to welcome Miles, Dr. Miles, as our new executive director to the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. Miles is a practicing physician at St. Peter's Hospital in Hamilton and is also a professional engineer. And he spearheaded a number of other organizations like the Shelter Health Network, which is a collaboration of healthcare professionals, social service organizations serving high-risk populations without stable housing and who have complex health problems. Trees for Hamilton, which is a charitable organization which plants native trees and shrubs in the Hamilton, greater Hamilton area with a focus on healthcare areas. And Peach Health Ontario, whose mission is to cultivate and sustain partnerships across healthcare facilities in Ontario and support climate action. So please welcome Miles. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. You weren't supposed to do that, but uh, thanks anyway. And uh, thank you, Maura, that was awesome. I'm gonna go through this quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Um, so I'm going to talk about medical imaging, uh, which obviously includes x-ray, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and, uh, and the fact that we all need to do better. I'm absolutely not trying to point fingers here. We're all in this together, and uh, I think we can do better both inside the building and outside of the building. Um, I don't do many talks without uh, showing this slide, which is becoming a bit ubiquitous, I think, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, this is the UK carbon footprint uh, assessment slide. This, this looks at the carbon footprint of the entire UK uh, national health system. So this is ambulances, dentists, offices, uh, primary care, hospitals, long-term care, all blended in together here. Um, and the point I wanna make here, which further to what Maura was saying, is you see the arrows on both sides and on the, the right, the blue arrow is showing the production of the things that we make, all the medical devices, et cetera. Part of that would be uh, medical imaging devices. And then on the left is what we do inside the building, uh, building energy. So that speaks to uh, you know unplugging the machine at night, for example. So what this, this is the same study. You can actually break this down. And I asked uh, Arib, who works at Peach, to make a, a pie of the uh, just the hospital uh, carbon footprint within the NHS. And you can see that the, the sizes of the pieces of pie change a little bit. Pharmaceuticals actually become smaller at the top, 16%. But then we have medical equipment. Again, part of this is going to be medical imaging. Uh, on the right, and then we have uh, the use or building energy on, on the left. And next slide, what I want to point out is that 
uh, you know, the, the concept of drawdown, how much can we draw down these slices of pie? How much can we make them smaller? And we can actually show that on the left, building energy, people have been working on this for years. Um, you know, I think when people think about doing better uh, environmentally, greening the health system, greening your own, uh, the way you live, we have thought for years about transportation. We have thought for years about building energy. Um, these aren't new concepts. And so as a result, uh, this is UK again, same database from 1990 to present on the lowest piece there, building energies dropped from seven megatons down to three. This is geothermal. This is LED lights. Uh, this is uh, better boilers, et cetera, all these things that engineers, designers have been thinking about for years and years. And then you look at the medical equipment piece, which is essentially unchanged over 30 years. And are the engineers smarter in one sector than the other? Um, I don't think so. But when we as uh, physicians or clinicians ask the, the medical equipment companies to do better. We are asking for better images. We're asking for better ultrasound technology, better x-ray, uh, CT, et cetera. And I think that has been the focus. So it's it's exciting. Some of the stuff Maura is saying about refurbishing. I don't, you know, we haven't really got there yet, but th th that's a great way we can draw down that piece of the pie. Um, in terms of sustainable procurement or buying things which are greener, uh, clearly, there are companies uh, out there that have been doing a great job for years. And uh, I hopefully am not holier than thou in this sector because I am part of the healthcare system. And we unfortunately are not a clean system. You could argue some of these companies are doing a better job than we are. Um, we did co-create a sustainable procurement working group last summer in Ontario. And we do hope to push or nudge vendors to do better. And how do we do that? Well, in Ontario, our group includes the um, SSOs and the uh, the GPOs, uh, which are in Ontario, as well as hospital procurement leads of some of the big buyers in Ontario. Uh, and there are about 20 hospitals in our group now. Uh, we also are, you know, I personally reached out to thought leaders in sustainable procurement. We do not learn much about this in medical school, uh, and they have helped us along the way. And of course, the sustainable healthcare organizations are there as well. And we do have represent representation from physicians who are in the sector that ask for procurement. I, you know, as a as a hospitalist, I don't, but the anesthetists and surgeons obviously do. And so, what are we doing as a group? Uh, so, two the two first steps are one to send a signal uh, to industry. Uh, and the second is to start putting sustainability scoring into RFPs. And so the signal to the community of vendors is essentially just giving people a heads up. We plan to start looking at sustainability as part of what we're buying. So again, we're working with the shared services organizations, the group purchasing organizations to communicate our position to the vendor community that's stronger, consistent requirements related to ESG and sustainability are an immediate priority when procuring both non-clinical and clinical products and services. So the part of the issue is that life cycle analysis is difficult for an individual product. I often think about medications when I think about this. When you are making a proton pump inhibitor, very, very common medication uh, for reflux, there are many of them out there. It's hard to look at that individual pill and trace it and say, you know, who's making the best PPI, but you can look at the companies and say, how are they rated and how do we do that? The big companies, the billion dollar owners uh, or earners rather, are rated by some not-for-profits that have been around for a long time. I've listed them here on the second line, and I verified the best I can that these are some of the best um, not-for-profits at rating companies. So uh, we do look at this now in terms of who are the best companies, who have been trying to do this for years and years and, and trying to do a great job making products. Um, and Another point here, we're starting to do this in healthcare in terms of adding sustainability language to contracts. 
Uh, as I say in the bottom there, healthcare needs to catch up. Industry, obviously companies have been doing this for a long time. Universities are now putting this language into their contracts and municipalities are as well. And I am passing it over to Linda here to talk about some governmental stuff. Linda. Thanks, Miles. Uh, just a, a couple of slides to bring everybody perhaps to the same level of information. Canada did make uh, commitments to the COP26 health program initiative, and they made two commitments. The first one is on climate resilient health systems. So we're expecting uh, that uh, our government will lead us through to uh, develop our climate resilient health systems for the future. Next. And uh, the second one being sustainable low carbon health systems. Just back up a second, Miles. Thank you. So the second one being uh, low carbon health systems uh, in which we'll have a health system net zero emission deadline, hopefully by 2050, um, that we'll have a baseline of assessments of greenhouse gas emissions of the health system, including the supply chain, and we'll have a roadmap going forward. Canada is one of 63 countries, so you'll see the map on the right hand side that has made these commitments. Next. So to date, uh, we have some great initiatives starting from the federal government, and they are now as part of their greening government uh, strategy uh, and part of their policy on green procurement, they're going to be starting to ask for disclosures on, on um, their greenhouse gas emissions from the people they purchase from, in particularly number two, uh, this starts in April 2023, and so procurements over 25 million will need to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. Miles, next. This has been happening for a lot longer in the UK, and a lot uh, more uh, support has been given to the businesses that they um, have in their supply chain. So in, in at the NHS, since April 2022, all procurements will include a minimum of 10% net zero and social value weighting. So that's 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 a biggie. Uh, since April this year, all contracts over 5 million, they'll require suppliers to publish a carbon reduction plan for scope one and scope two. And by 2027, this will be scope one, two, and three for all suppliers. Next. And we're not talking about uh, something that's minuscule. I just wanted to point this out. This is Kai Hai data showing medical imaging spending is on the list of the top spending areas within hospitals across Canada. Right, next. So we do have another initiative that's happening. And just south of the border, um, the USAPI is developing an Energy Star standard for medical imaging equipment. The scope includes MRIs, CTs, general radiology x-rays, mammography, nuclear imaging, and ultrasound. They're basing their, um, their protocols on something that's been happening in Europe for the last number of years and the industry sector there that has developed certain testing procedures to make sure everything is harmonized. Next. And they've actually identified that there's significant savings um, when equipment is put on low scan or low power modes as as Mora has pointed out so they want to capitalize that on that uh, in the development of the energy star um, standards for medical imaging equipment and we know that for example in ontario there's about 27 or so mris that are going to be purchased in the next little while um, and uh, this is some information that should be available to the people that are pulling these contracts together so that um, we have sustainability included in some of those contracts. And I think that's about it. And I think what we can do now is open our uh, open up for questions if anybody has any questions and the three of us will be happy to to respond. So, um, Anybody have any questions that we can address? Uh, looks like there's one question in the chat right now. Um, Rob asked, can SSOs and GPOs be defined? Okay, yes. Uh, shared services organizations and group purchasing organizations. Uh, the group purchasing organizations in Canada, uh, I think they're just two, um, Health Pro and Mohawk MedBuy, that uh, buy medications, for example, in a large amount for, for 
uh, hospitals across Canada. And I think and one of the it, earlier yeah, questions. Ahead, Linda, yeah. oh, yeah. sorry. One of the earlier questions: uh, Will a recording be available? This session is recorded, so that will be available. Um, the question about slide deck sharing: We haven't asked Mora that. Mora, what's your feeling on that? <laughs> Rookie mistake. Um, <laughs> I think um, that's fine. I, I don't, everything is referenced on the slides. So please, if you use anything, um, make sure you, mostly it should be for personal use and your own information. If you choose to reproduce anything, make sure that you give credit to whoever originally made the infographic or anything that I've used. Thank you. So I think uh, Autumn will be sending information out to people on how to access. Okay, so um, can I ask a question, um, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay, Mora. Yeah. Easy wins. What are the, what are the easy wins? Do you think uh, you know potentially on on both sides on the on the production side that might be that might be out of scope for you, no pun intended. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> or on the the inside, like uh, you know, is it is it a matter of just unplugging machines? Is that the is that the easy win? It's actually. Um, turning off PAX machines at night is more complicated than you think it would be. Um, turning off personal computers like that um, admin staff have, turning off laser printers, and laser printers apparently consume an enormous amount of energy, even when they're on like a standby mode, and they can be programmed to be turned off overnight. Um, encouraging, you know, things like LED lights and motion sensors if your buildings are going through some retrofits to save electricity. If you do interventional radiology, one of the pretty easy wins is like they do in the OR and reducing the number of air exchanges and allowing a wider range of temperature between, um, you know, instead of tight controls when you're not at work, like over weekends and evenings, to let the temperature range go higher and lower. And apparently it's completely safe to do that. And most institutions, it's like less than an hour to get it back to what you need to be um, sterile and, and um Okay, so reducing airflow in the OR becomes complicated due to CSA codes. So that's something that I think facilities would need to start investigating because there's obviously big savings that way. Um, and then in like radiologists can set your pack stations. As you guys know, we have like four screens and they're they're pretty high resolution and they use a lot of energy. So if you set so that they go to the screensaver mode after you're away for five or 10 minutes, instead of just leaving them on all the time, that can save quite a bit of energy as well. Um, Shutting off PAX machines at night is typically not done, but it's something that we need to start working on. Um, and I think really the most important thing is to find allies in your workplace and um, find something that would be helpful. Like <laughs> I found our department and got rid of all the little plastic garbage bags that were in all the garbage, like it, we had to get rid of the garbage cans. So now we have like two or three big ones, but we don't have like little ones at the desk and it saved like 16,000 plastic bags a year. So that was just like, took me an afternoon with the cleaning staff, but it's a great opportunity to have conversations with people because these changes happen through conversation and people realizing why it matters to them and the health impacts. And for us out in BC, it's a lot about smoke and wildfire and lots of people love camping. And so it's easy to make connections and that's really important. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely. So Luke has a question. Any indications if and when SSO and GPOs in Canada are going to start include suppliers to share their carbon footprint, current and future goals as part of their vendor evaluation process? Linda, do you want to take a crack at that? I was just going to say, I think this is starting to happen, Luke. I think it really is. Um, we haven't quite nailed it down yet, but in the discussions we've been having, this is definitely on the table. One of the um, one of the issues or one of the things that has been talked about is that uh, the NHS system has the NHS has a great system in doing for doing this, and it's affecting um, global companies. Um, the U.S. has now committed to using the NHS approach to supply chain uh, greening and lowering the greenhouse gas emissions. Canada has been invited to participate in that, but we have not heard that yet. 
So it might be that it's up to individual group purchasing organizations and hospital purchasing to actually take that step. So we we would, I think the best thing to do is be in concert with the international community. Um, but it really is, um, it really is on the table, but we're, we can't announce anything. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> yeah. So I, I would just add that um, the sustainable procurement champions who are out there who have advised us would say that the language in procurement contracts, which is typically about cost and quality, should include as much as 30% sustainability or a mix of ESG sustainability. When I tell that to the uh, procurement leads at the table in Ontario, they laugh at me um, and say, look, the highest we could go is 5%. So, and then, and then in terms of sending a signal to the industry, which is about to go out, of course, we want to be fair. It's not going to start tomorrow. We want to give people a heads up that this will be added to uh, um, uh, procurement contracts. Is it six months away? And then, as you know, the procurement people, uh, it requires a contract that is coming up for renewal. Uh, you know, we're not going to change a contract that's already, you know, in existence. So we need to look at the contracts that are coming up. We need to look at contracts that have competition. If in today's supply chain world, there's only one vendor we can use, there's not much we can do about it. Um, so what I'm hoping happens, that if we start out with what I would consider a low bar, that we raise it over time. And as Linda says, in the UK, it started at 10%. And let's face it, when we're talking about the billion dollar revenue companies, we're all using the same companies worldwide. <clears throat> Marcus has indicated that it's starting to happen at Mohawk Medby, baby steps. May I just, I, I see a question yeah. from Jared, which looks, is interesting. What level of climate literacy and priority are we seeing in hospital management and administration? I'm out in BC and it's actually the mandate letters that come from the Ministry of Health to the lead of each health authority. We have six health authorities in the province. The mandate letters include five um, essentials and goals for the year of which one is mitigating emissions through climate change. So they know it's on their radar. It's something that they need to do. And I have found quite often with the work I've done with the BC Cancer Planetary Health Unit and then the CT scanner, that there's actually a lot of support in administration for doing these projects. Um, often, someone else asked about cost. Often, the, the, the number I've heard from Nick Watts in the UK um, is that 80% are cost neutral or better. And the remaining 20% that have some capital outlay required are the average time for payback, the revenue neutrality is three and a half years. So even if some money is required up front, my experience uh, in my institution has been that the healthcare leaders are quite willing to put forward that money, both because it makes them look good, it fulfills their mandate, and it uh, is often cost neutral. One of the things we did early on is got rid of the exam table paper in outpatient. Like if you go to see your doctor, there's paper on the table. And just in one facility, we saved 2,200 kilometers of paper and it, all six facilities across BC, we saved $15,000 for no capital outlay. So often these decarbonizing things are also cost saving. So I hope that answers that question. It's, it's one o'clock and I think we have a few more questions. So if people are willing to stay, um, I think us as panelists, we, we're willing to stay. So um, hang in there and we'll I'll get to a few more questions here. Um, one question um, from Aaron, have any green commitments been made at a national pan-Canadian level within healthcare? If so, who is, should be leading a national strategy within the Canadian healthcare system? Example, sim similar to the NHS. So this is a toughie. We've got 13 governments that lead uh, delivery of healthcare. And I think this is the challenge. Um, NHS England has a strategy, um, they're one level of delivery. Uh, we have 13, so um, who should be leading it? If we could all lead together, that would be great. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has any comments on that. Um, it's, uh, you know, the group purchasing, the national group purchasing organizations have a role to play here, but I think Healthcare organizations have a significant role to play. Miles, why don't you uh, talk about that? 
Yeah, I, I got to say that that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking that until until governments step up and they're going to step up in different provinces at different times. And of course, the federal government is doing things, but maybe not as much as we like. I, uh, you mentioned the procurement of contracts above, I think it was twenty five million dollars. And I know some people feel that that number should be smaller than that. So, I mean, that's a great step, but it should be smaller. So in the meantime, it's us. It's everybody on the call. You know, it's more in Linda and Autumn. So you know, obviously the, the Green Coalition, it's a coalition. We're trying to move this forward. Cascades is a great organization trying to move this forward. There are things happening. Um, Hussein Mulu comes to mind in terms of the, uh, the, the colleges. So there is a big movement here and we have to keep pushing. Uh, I would also say in response to one of the questions there about hospitals, um, I can speak best about Ontario. I know BC is certainly ahead of us, but in Ontario, gosh, it, it feels like dominoes, uh, hospital leadership taking this on. And uh, look, you can look at the the the, um, the coalition website and see the uh, tools that we have for leadership to help leadership take this on. And uh, yes, there, I think there's a question there about the appetite of leadership. Of course, it's gonna be different. But Accreditation Canada, almost a year ago, has added this to accreditation across the country for hospitals and for long-term care to start uh, looking at sustainability. So that's why we put out uh, the guidebooks to help leaders take this on. So look, there, there's a lot happening. I think this is uh, increasing exponentially in terms of people getting interested. So we will do this together. Linda. Sure. <laughs> if, I, if I can just I'm say passing it back to the host. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> can I no, one? To say yeah, Mara. Like, yay, Miles, because I think that's exactly in healthcare, we, we don't even realize it, but we're really siloed in how we think and how we assess problems. And like the example of the project we did in CT, we had to call in um the energy and environment, like radiologists normally wouldn't be inviting energy and environmental sustainability operations team into their department. And then there's a third party company that does energy assessments and we got BC Hydro. So that was like four different groups of people who usually wouldn't necessarily connect on stuff, solving a problem together. And I really think that um, there's so many ways where looking outside of our usual thought processes, outside of our usual silos, talking to people that have different worldviews and different ways of solving problems is the way forward because we can't solve our problems by staying in our silos and thinking the same way. So that's the part about reaching out for, to find allies in areas of healthcare that are maybe different than what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter what part of healthcare you're in. Yeah. And um, I just little, wanted go ahead, Linda. To, to maybe say, if you're on the call still, and you know we started off with you know double what's on the call, but if you're on the call still, that means you're pretty interested. If you are interested, reach out to us because there's ways that we could use your interest. I'm sure. There are some real stars on the call, uh, Linda. If you've looked at the, the list, I, I, won't, I won't embarrass anybody. But we um, we are about to with the coalition um, come up with uh, what we're calling the ideal green city or ideal green community and looking at how healthcare fits into that and some of the concepts that Maura mentioned like circular economy and, and, and so the, the whole point is that we do need to work together and not have these silos we need to reach out to manufacturing uh both you know the big manufacturers and the smaller ones of who's going to be doing the refurbishing of these sorts of machines so uh yeah, look, there's a lot of excitement here and a lot of positivity. All right. I think we're, if we haven't answered your question and you still have a question you want to ask, please reach out to us. But um, we're now at 106. Thanks for hanging in there with us. And thank you so much, Maura. This was just such a wonderful presentation that you were able to share with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you. We're educating a lot of people. <laughs> And thank you. Uh, thank you to our new executive director, Miles. And thank you to Autumn. And I think we're good. Well, thank you, Linda. Right. <laughs> okay. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me along. It was great. Of course.